Good morning, family of God. J.P. Greer here from Sentinels for Christ for SFC's 15 in the Word on this 30th day of September 2022. Can you believe it is the last day of September in 2022? It is true. It feels like the years go faster as we get older. Today we're going to be digging into Acts chapter 8 in our continuing series where we walk through uh, the Bible every time we get together one chapter at a time. We primarily spend most of the time just reading the Word and then take a little bit of time to uh, give you some commentary to pull out those elements which seem to promote the most confusion in Scripture. Sometimes reading the Bible is a confusing thing, so we want to pull that out so you're blessed. But we want to bless you as you go into your weekend because this is a fantastic chapter. Um, for many reasons, because the Holy Spirit continues his work through the early church, and that is where we're going to pick up. If you remember, last time we were together, when we left off, the disciple, Stephen, had just been stoned for his faith. He had been arrested in chapter 6. He was brought into the Jewish court, the Sanhedrin, in chapter 7. He was asked to answer for charges, pretty much, of heresy and a dismissal of the Jewish faith, and he gave his response in a faith debate back to the priest, which was the whole entity of chapter 7. But at the end of chapter 7, he paid for it with his life because the hearers did not want to hear what he had to say, which was the following key word, that God, when people obey him, gives the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, there is a condition to have in fellowship, in relationship with God, and it's obedience. And obedience can be behavioral stuff that we do, really. But what Stephen was really referring to was the issue of the heart, wanting to receive and, and desiring to receive the truth that Jesus Christ was Lord and risen from the dead. So it's after this that immediately the martyrdom or the killing of Stephen produces a huge persecution on the church, which had probably been, been going along now for a, a minimum of uh, six to nine months to up to a couple years at this point. And let's see what happens, okay? Acts chapter 8, verse 1. On that day, the day that Stephen was killed, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. Except for the apostles, all were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Now, godly men took up Stephen's body and buried him and mourned loudly for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. He was going from house to house, and he dragged off both men and women who professed to be Christians and put them in prison. Now, Acts is interesting. I'm going to divert from the text just for a second, that when it introduces a new person, sometimes they jump out of nowhere. The Apostle Paul who at this time is known as Saul, was introduced to us at the end of the last chapter because he was there at the death of Stephen. He actually watched the garments, the overcoats of the people who killed him, okay? Now, those who had been scattered as a result of this persecution preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. And when the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame or healed. So there was great joy in that city. Now for some time, there was a man in that city named Simon, and he had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great. And all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and respect and exclaimed, this man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. And Simon himself believed and was baptized. Don't miss that about Simon or you're not going to understand the chapter. Okay. And he followed Philip everywhere astonished by the great signs and miracles that he saw. Now, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. They sent Peter and John, the established original apostles, to Samaria. Don't miss that. Now, when they arrived, 
they prayed for the new believers that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. I want something to stick out to you right now. These people believed in Jesus as the Messiah, accepted the word of salvation, and believed. In the New Testament, when it talks about people believing, that is inferred that they have become Christians. Yet here we have a group of Christians who the Holy Spirit has not come down upon. That's an interesting thing, okay? They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay, may lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter responded to Simon, May your silver and gold perish with you because you thought that you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part in this share of this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you're full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon said, Pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. And after they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, this is Simon, uh, this is Peter and John at this point, okay? Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, and they were preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, to the desert road, that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, Philip, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Candake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. Now this man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home, he was sitting in his chariot, reading from the book of Isaiah, the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. <laughs> I love that. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah, the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him in the chariot. This is the passage of scripture that the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. And in his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who's the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here's water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared in Astos and traveled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. It's interesting. Philip ends up in Caesarea because by the time the apostle Paul starts coming back to Jerusalem, um, he, he goes to Caesarea and before he gets into Jerusalem, these are the final chapters of Acts, really, uh, Acts chapter 22 through 28, I'm jumping ahead. He stops in Philip. Uh, he stops in Philip's house in Caesarea. Philip has four virgin daughters who are prophets at that time, and they have some fellowship together. So this is the same Philip. Um, kind of neat, huh? Let's talk a little bit about Acts chapter 8 um, with the time that we have left so that you're blessed. Um, one of the things that we study in the ministry of Sentinels for Christ is, is the work of the early church and what it looked like. And we're actually preparing a, a teaching at this time. Um, we, it's called the Supernatural Church, and, and we take the position in that teaching. We try and explain why that the church in Acts is a model for what the church ought to be doing today. And when I say a model for the church of the day, I mean all of it. I mean preaching the word of Jesus, preaching it boldly, and experiencing the supernatural ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, there are many people in Christendom who don't be, don't believe that the Holy Spirit works the way that the Holy Spirit does at, at, um, anymore on, on planet Earth, okay? In fact, about three-quarters of Christendom believe that. It's a particular uh, teaching. It's called cessationalism. 
um, which means to cease, to stop. We don't take that position at the Ministry of Sentinels for Christ, and mainly because I've seen too many miracles, supernatural events that couldn't be explained um, to, to believe that that position. But it's it's in this this chapter that we see something remarkable take place. Prior to the eighth, uh, really the sixth chapter of Acts, the Holy Spirit was moving through the twelve apostles as the leaders of the church. And and while we can assume that because there were 120 believers in the original group, and that the Holy Spirit dropped on all of those believers. And that it appears from Acts chapter 2 at the day of Pentecost that all those believers, um, because the inference of the Holy Spirit falling on all the believers is not just that the apostles got these tongues of fire that landed on them in Acts chapter 2. All 120 did. But they were preaching and, and proclaiming and prophesying the great works of God. But it was mainly Jewish. And it was mainly Jews who were Orthodox Jews or lived in Palestine and who had a, at that time a combined Christian faith that was trying to figure out how do you be a Christian and still honor the components of the law, what's relevant now and what's not. And this is a huge part of really the first half of the book of Acts is the church figuring out what to keep a hold of that was valuable from um, Judaism and, and, and what was not. And I tell you, there are groups of Christians today that just throw out um, Judaism in its entirety, and I'm not telling people you need to become a Jew to become a Christian. Don't get confused with that. But the reality is that Jesus Christ was a Jew. Ah, ooh, some of you are going to go, wow, I really haven't thought about that. But it's true. Um, so we cannot throw out Judaism because God has worked through the nation of Israel um, and will continue to work through the, the nation of Israel, particularly in the end times. And the Apostle Paul makes it crystal clear in the 11th chapter of Romans that God has never abandoned Israel. Why is it important to say that? Because there, there's a group of Christians, non-Jewish Christians, who teach that um, when the Jews failed in their mission to present God to the world in a way that the world accepted him, that God completely um, threw away the Jewish nation and that the new Jews become the Christian church. That is not taught in Scripture, okay? Um, although there are inferences that as brothers and sisters in Christ, both Hebrews, Jews, and non-Jews are one family. That's clearly taught, Ephesians chapter 2. But this issue of just Jews was a big issue with the church. It comes around, if you remember in, in chapter 6, that in this community of new believers, which had exploded, there are probably at least 10,000 people in that community by, by Acts chapter 6, that there was favoritism going on. Um, and that the widows who no longer had their husbands that were Jewish or were ethnically Jewish and practiced Judaism um, and Christianity were being favored over non-Jewish uh, but still Jews that were Hellenistic, more Greek-speaking Jews. And it created a problem in the church, and the church solved that by saying, okay, solve this by um, setting up leaders um, that take care of this problem for us. See, the church was good at confronting these issues and getting on top of it real quick. And what they did was they selected seven men who were uh, Greek-speaking Jews, okay? One of them actually wasn't even a Jew. He was a proselyte, Nick, uh, Nicholas, the, the final uh, name mentioned in Acts chapter uh, 6 of these seven men, to take care of this problem. Well, two of these men are right here in chapter 8, okay? Or 7 and 8. Stephen and uh, Philip. Well, we know what happened to Stephen. And, uh, he got, he was uh, an amazing Christian, he was a disciple. Stephen was not an apostle as far as an original apostle is defined. And when I mean an original apostle, I mean the 12 apostles um, that followed Jesus, okay? But he was a powerful disciple, and he ministered through signs and wonders. He knew his Bible. And Stephen um, died in the previous chapter, but Philip didn't, because what had happened was the scattering because of Stephen enabled the church to move out from Jerusalem, and that's what this is all about. The Holy Spirit, writing through Luke in Acts chapter 8, makes it clear that the church now is spreading out amongst the nation and the world amongst non-Jewish Christians or non-hardline Jewish Christians. And that's why the focus really in chapter 8 is, is Philip, the Greek-speaking Jew having this incredible ministry which we just read about. Um, some of the miracles that occur in, in that are, are rather remarkable miracles that, that are, are not seen that often, okay? But it is Greek-speaking Jews that are now bringing the gospel, which is why in Acts chapter 8 it says that these people took the gospel to other lands which were not Jewish. And we will find in chapter 9 that 
again, the writer of the book of Acts reminds us that those who were scattered, particularly men of Cyrene and Alexandria, and it is speaking about Hellenistic Jews, Greek-speaking Jews, felt in their hearts to take the gospel out and beyond Judaism. So we're seeing the Holy Spirit move from Jewish centrism when it comes to the gospel to fulfilling, of course, the great prophetical words of Jesus when he said it in, in John um, chapter 14 when he was talking about I, I have others that are my sheep that I will also reach out to that are not of this family he was referring to you and me non-Jewish people at that time so this is an amazing chapter showing the goodness of God in his crazy timing that at the right time and the right place that God decided to do this and show his grace for the world um, through people who were not necessarily at the center of Jesus ministry but had received Jesus and received the same type of power the impartation from the Holy Spirit to do the work of the kingdom of God. What is the primary work of the kingdom of God? To do miracles, to amaze people? No. Does that come with the territory? Absolutely. The primary work of the kingdom of God is to make disciples, which means we have to tell people the story of Jesus, okay? And notice that in both of Philip's ministry, when he goes into Samaria, he it, the emphasis on the word is he tells people about Jesus and their need for him and they get saved. And then it references that people were believing because of the signs and wonders he was performing too. But they were just complimenting the ministry at that time of Philip. Same thing happens with the eunuch on the chariot, okay? He's engaging that man and he preaches Jesus to that man. There are no miracles, okay? He has to go down to Gaza, find this guy that the Holy Spirit has set up this divine appointment with and tell him about Jesus. He starts from a, a place in Isaiah that's talking about Jesus. And explains the gospel to him, obviously effective enough that the eunuch knows that he needs to be water baptized and declare a public faith in Jesus. And then the miracle takes place after the conversion. Isn't that amazing, right? Philip is supernaturally um, translated. There's a particular word for that. In the Greek, the word does not uh, infer that Philip walked away. The Greek word for Philip being taken up is a Greek word that means translation, supernaturally removed. The Greek word okay, for appear in Astos, where Philip is taken up from the eunuch and appears in Astos, infers a supernatural moving of this man in the spirit, okay? Anything preached um, other than that is really preaching something out of the context of the text to try and diminish the supernatural. We don't do that at Sentinels for Christ, because I'll tell you what, <laughs> this old world doesn't need Jim Greer and his Christian intellectualism. This world needs Jesus and the power of God. And when God chooses to do supernatural things through the ministry of you or me or your church or your ministry, we get out of the way and we let God do that. But we put up guardrails, okay, and make sure that what is done all times edifies God and points to the gospel. So I hope that blesses you as you go into the weekend. Please check out our website at uh, SFC JP Greer on Facebook. We've got a great uh, message there, about 30 minutes from our friend Pastor Stephen Watkins up at Wind River Reservation that we posted last week. Like it, let him know. You can go to our YouTube channel as well, which is Sentinels for Christ, one word, where we got some great teachings going on right now, um, some messages that will encourage you and be blessed. So may the Lord bless you. May he keep you, may he make his face shine upon you and give you peace. And we all need peace in this world right now, don't we? In Jesus' name, J.P. Greer from Sentinels for Christ signing out until Monday when we meet again. <laughs>